South's President George Piggins intends to continue his fight against the NRL and News Limited. And then you subpoena them, and then you get them to open the books, and you see who's been fair dinkum. One of the most famous clubs of all, South Sydney. 20 premierships in a battle for survival. We're not going to go away. We're going to ride the storm and we're going to together. Heaps. Yeah. Now I've known Nick for many, many years. Um, I knew his father, who was a leading member of the community here, um, and uh, uh, one of the uh, elders of the St. Spiridon's Greek Church uh, at Kingsford, um, and, and, the, uh, and the Greek uh, community in Australia. Nick has carried on that tradition, and it's fair to say that uh, his, his efforts during that period and since um, are quite extraordinary. And I take my hat off to him. Um, uh, he's been one of the great assets of this club, for this club, um, over all these years. I grew up in Marine Parade, Maroubra in the 60s, son of migrants. Uh, who settled in the eastern suburbs, uh, formed an attachment to the club immediately. My father was involved in soccer. He chaired one of the Sydney soccer clubs. But my love was always rugby league. My cousins of my age group followed south, so I just went where they went. They took me to the SCG every second Saturday for the match of the round. And I latched on. And I'd go straight from Wentworth Park, where our Greek soccer club was playing, I'd rush across to Redfern Oval to catch the match in the afternoon. In 1996, I opened my own law firm, 25 years ago, down in Bly Street, the bunker we used to call it because it was below ground. At a previous function, we had several lawyers turned up and gave Nolene their card. One of them was Nick Pappas. We had a meeting at the Sydney set room at, um, at South Sydney, at the old Leagues Club, and we gathered all the, all the legal people who were friends of South's. You know, every lawyer that, uh, that we knew was in that room, and one by one, they all gave their impressions of what we could do, uh, how we could fight this legal battle. Um, Nicholas was one of the last to speak. That's where the fight back started. Follow me. This look? That camera looks a bit crooked. It's like that. I know my head's crooked, but... Like two little ears there. Well, I was born in Redfern, Redfern Road, right next door to Redfern Oval in 1964. My parents moved there in the 50s and uh, with nine kids. Uh, all the boys were South supporters, as you can imagine. John Sattler was my favourite and George Piggins and uh, Terry Fay was my favourite. I love Terry Fay. When we got to my teenage years, like 15, 14, 15, 16, um, we used to go there and uh, to Redfern Oval to watch Souths and uh, sometimes we couldn't get our favourite spot which is right in the middle. 
on the hill. And so what I'd do to get our spot, I'd walk up there and just pretending I was having some sort of like a fit or something. And I'd be just chucking myself up and down and on the floor. And then people would go, what's going on? And then it'll clear, it'll clear. Then all my mates will all come up. We'll have about 10 of us sitting there and we clear thing. And that was that. I did it once. And then every time we went there, they wanted me to do it every week. And people knew. They'd see me walking up and they'd go, move out of the way. Let's get this guy's going to jump up and down. The guy who did the tap for me was a sales fan and he um, didn't charge me. <laughs> I got a friend, Tori Lombardo, he um, was clearing out his shed and come across his video camera and he was going to toss it and I said, give it to me and he goes, you've never filmed before. I said, give it to me man, I'll, I'll start now. He goes, what are you going to film? I, I go, I'll film. He said to me, you can film South Sydney. I said, no, nah, you can't film South because, you know, there's, you know, they got Channel 9 and all that sort of stuff. He goes, give it a try. So I rang up the South Leagues Club and asked for Craig Coleman. Sure enough, he was right there. And she goes, yeah, he's right here. Here he is. And I went, oh, my God. And so, hello, Craig. Um, my name's John. I just bought a video camera. Do you mind if I come down and um, film your boys training? And he goes, yeah, come down. And I went, oh, OK. Thanks. I um, updated my camera because it was an old one. It was an old VHS. You put the whole VHS. It was a good thing about it. It's like you take it out and you just whack it straight and you can watch. So I updated it to digital one. And um, next thing you know, I found myself in the middle of a march. There's the first step, Johnny Sattler and George Biggins. Woohoo! I'm hopeful that within a week uh, we will have explored all the avenues of appeal so that we can lodge South's appeal as soon as possible. During a very hasty interview process that was uh, conducted by the then board, led by George, I was the last one called in to give a presentation. You might have heard this story before, pardon me if I'm repeating myself but I remember thinking along the same lines as George that I liked what I heard when Nick was spoke um, and it was it wasn't even the specifics of the law it was just the passion you could see he had for the, for the Rabbitohs. I've been encouraged and uh, the whole legal team from Tom Hughes to Richard White to Michael Shai, Alison Schiff, the whole team has been encouraged, fortified and I must say heartened by the support you've all shown and the undying commitment that you've displayed towards this club. So keep it going. And we'll, we'll get there. Well, there was 20 quite eminent legal minds in the line. Each one had to give a little pitch to the board. The board was lined up like a like judge and jury in front of us. And I was the last because I arrived late. And I'd only arrived late because I'd only got notice from, from George, who I didn't know really up to that point that they were going to interview the lawyers, so they, they were ready when the, the decision was made. And I walked in late while, the, while some guy in front of me was doing his pitch, you know, they were going into the legalities and what we could do and what an injunction would mean and what this would mean. I hadn't done any research. I walked in, up came my turn. I sort of got up and said, oh, look, I haven't researched any of the law. I don't actually know what we're going to rely on, but I'm going to fight to the death. And I sat down. I thought, I've blown it, I've blown it. My one chance to represent the club I love, and I've blown it. And, uh, you know, I was a real Dennis Denudo, you know, from the castle, you know. That's what I look like today. <laughs> Maybe I still look like that. But uh, got the job. Facts came from George. And I remember walking around the office showing it to someone, to my staff, saying, can you believe this, can you believe this? And all of a sudden, my, my life changed. I understand. I remember a couple of days later on the radio, significant South people were saying, well, who's this cowboy that George has got to fight this fight for us? But George saw something in Nicholas that night and, uh, and it went from there.
the club became my client just to, upon receipt of that fax. The minute I took the fax out of the fax machine, the club was my client. But so were, was every South Sydney supporter in the country or in the world. They were all my client. And amongst them were the, were the common supporter, the, the rusted on, dedicated supporter, who never asked a question and just dutifully followed when we told them to follow. The manic supporter, who wanted to tell you what to do, what we were going to do, who was coming into the office unannounced. And the celebrity supporter, people like Denton and Jones and Whitney and Martin, and this variegated landscape of supporters, of high profile supporters, each of whom, of course, played an incredibly important role because they were so variegated, because they were so diverse. And that was one of the wild cards we had, that we didn't just have, as they expected, the manic supporter or the very humble supporter who would roll over. We had these very high profile people who could give us a broader interface with the community. We had to win the battle outside. We've been laughed at, we've been mocked, we've been scorned, we've been told we're dead, we've been told we don't count, we've been told to give it up. And this is the answer to those people that have said that. Look around you. I do remember talking about a rally and a rally to involve uh, all clubs, not just Souths, because it was, you know, they were kicking out Norths and they did, and they were effectively kicked out West. And I was on radio at the time doing breakfast radio, so I was hearing from a lot of people about their distress over this, real distress, because football, and particularly rugby league, and particularly for a club like Souths, yes, it's a game, and yes, it's a, a diversion on the weekends, but it, it, it's also, it's, it's a very important diversion. It's actually part of the story and the fabric, fabric of this district. So it's much more than a game. And this is kind of like a really big, powerful multinational company ripping something out from one of the poorest parts of Sydney. So it was a lot of people understood it as uh, an issue beyond sport. And there was a, a very respected journalist called Caroline Jones, not really a rugby league person particularly, and she wrote this column in the paper, and I still remember it, and she addressed it directly to Lachlan Murdoch. She said, when you're doing something that makes grown men cry, perhaps you should think again about what it is you're doing. I know that we all sat around in the boardroom, a whole heap of us, discussing how we could really uh, project ourselves and our, uh, and our anger and so forth. It was the most unlikely group of people, you know, people that don't, professionally and, and often personally get on, you know. Nobody's ever accused Alan Jones and I of being friends, for example. But everybody was around that table trying to work out what to do next. And I don't know who planned to do the rally, but we felt that was the, the best thing we could do, was to actually show that what was happening was wrong. But we didn't know how many people were gonna turn up. The rally, that was the first rally, that was the first thing we did. We ping and got up there and he said, We'll fight you, we'll take you to court. And so we put up a rally. We wanted all South fans, not just South fans, rugby league fans who were not happy with the way things were going. There was a lot of stuff, a lot of teams were disappointed, a lot of fans were turned off of what the decisions that were made, big decisions, ruined everything. So I thought, that's it, I'm taking my video camera. Oh, yes, that I actually suggested that we march Parts News Limited that we go round, we go to round with Racecourse. And it was actually Henry Morris who said, no, we need to go right up into Town Hall. Could not believe how successful it was and how many people rallied, mate. And South Juniors, through uh, Keith McCraw, organised our whole of the Junior League. We met them at Belmore Park. I guess a lot of the kids could march in it. Too long from Redfern on both of them and we joined in the march, mate as a sign of solidarity with our district club once again, mate. It is run by and Murdoch runs our game. I say, shame, shame, shame. At the time, uh, the town hall was um, booked the day we wanted it. On the so we're, we're, in the, we're in a board meeting and Albo picked up the phone to the Lord Mayor, Frank Sartor, and he said, we're going to have a rally this Sunday, we, we, on Sunday we're going to come. And he said, oh geez, let me check. He said, look, we've got a backpackers conference on. He said, no, nah, we're coming. <laughs> it's all right. People at News Limited were afraid that, 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 that we were going to march on News Limited and cause, become violent and all that. George made sure, he, he, he said to everybody at the time, I remember, he said, listen, there's not to be any violence. This is a peaceful protest. 
you know, he, not that we had any intention to be violent. George stood up and said, no violence, no bad behaviour. We're representing this club and we've got the support of mums and dads and grandparents and, and we don't want to give a bad look. We don't want people to be saying they're ruffians. Yeah, and I thought yeah, that was a wise move. We didn't expect the support of all those other clubs um, who had, um, you know, fought with Souths on the football field and suddenly lined up with their colours and with the, in, in, in unison, uh, as almost like part of our team. And as we looked around, it was just uh, like one of the, uh, the moratorium marches against the Vietnam War and so on, which you didn't expect that many people would turn up. And people were pouring off the train at Redfern and, uh, and, and getting on the end of the, the line there to march down George Street and so on to the city. And that was extraordinary. I mean, to see that there was uh, extraordinary. I thought, wow, well, you know, we've got a good thing going here. And to see that sort of numbers, I think when those numbers turned out, well, then that was really what started to scare uh, Murdoch and the, and the Murdoch newspapers, that um, they realised that they had a fight in their hands. They realised that this was a popular thing and newspapers were about sales and, uh, and if people were now saying, I'm not going to buy the Telegraph anymore, I'm not going to buy the news limited papers, I'm not going to watch the news, uh, watch Sky Television and that sort of stuff. And uh, there was some, you know, some, uh, some violent threats and some obscene things that should never have happened. Uh, but that's how passionate people felt about this. And I think that we got, at first March showed us how passionate um, Sydney was especially about rugby league and about, uh, in this case, about South. So I don't think any other side, had they been threatened, had they had a march, would have had the sort of appeal that Souths have. Can you keep it down, please? Thank you. How good it feels to protest like today, instead of sitting on your bum at home and watching on television tonight, to do it as we've done it today, when the cause is right. This cause is right. I'm with George Piggins two days before the rally and he gets a call as we're having lunch and then he says to me, that was Mick Cronin, and he said, could I come up and march with you? You know, we had Frank Hyde, we had Jack Gibson at the first rally, and I'm thinking, We've got Frank Hyde and Jack Gibson on our side. How could anybody be against us in the world of rugby league? But we do exist, and we'll exist as long as you people support us, as long as you back us. He seemed to go to another level there. He got a lot of confidence um, because it was a fight. He was in a different sort of fight, a fight to save the club, and the supporters were 100% behind him. That kept him going. I bought my wife. She doesn't like football. She refers to football as that awful noise. Um, but I bought her because I said this, this is a, about social equity. This is about the small end of town is going to march to the big end of town to ask for what's been taken back. And when we arrived, even though this was not her thing, she looked around at these people who had come from all over New South Wales and in some cases further than that. She saw this as mums and dads, you know, all walks of life. And she, she immediately got it. She saw that this is very important. And I remember I wasn't at the front, but I was not far from the front marching up George Street. I didn't know how many people had turned up. When we were at the club, it seemed like there were four or 5,000 people, which seemed a lot. And I remember walking up the steps of the town hall and looking back, and I'll never forget that moment, as far as you could see down George Street. Weirdly, even though it looked like it all was lost, that was the moment I thought we'd won. It was the biggest rally in Australia since the Vietnam War. And the next day, the Daily Telegraph, who were the main news limited paper, ran it as a story on page, I don't know what it was, 26 or 27, a story about that big. I thought, you guys are in trouble because you're in the business of public relations and you've got a public relations disaster on your hands. You cannot just tell someone to shut up shop but take the profits from what they've done. Ladies and gentlemen, if the NRL and the barons at News Limited remain intent on striking us down, let us give them the fight of their lives. Let's fight them in the law courts. And let's fight them in the courts of public opinion. It needs to be remembered that the media in Australia is largely controlled by News Limited. Most of the media is in their control. And uh, in this fight, they were very powerful institution, but they're also up against a mass movement 
This was a media battle, it wasn't just a football battle, but clearly it was football had become big business for Rupert Murdoch and for Kerry Packer as it had always been. And so what the newspapers didn't need was, uh, was to showcase uh, just how upset people were and how much support South had. So that first newspaper report did swear that um, there'd only been a couple of thousand people who walked down George Street. The newspapers um, uh, didn't want to tell that story and uh, certainly the Murdoch newspapers didn't want to tell the story. The Herald reported what had happened, but the others didn't. Um, the, the television channels reported what had happened. You saw on the television screens how many people there were. Ian Heads was working for the telly. Now, he wanted to, co he covered the first rally, but when the, when the telly put it on page 15, he was so upset, he resigned. And, and, and God love him, Ian was a rooster. He wasn't a rabbit -o. Ian Heads was a man of principle. He, he, he resigned on principle. This was the, the largest sporting protest in the history of this country. At the time, and that it was even bigger the second time. That's how much the South story meant to people. You know, and we talk about the rivalry with the Roosters to this day, and there's a great banner at the rallies, you know. One guy in an East Jumper walking up saying, South versus the Roosters. I'd love to see that again. See you later. Thank you. Well, the hardest part about it was News Limited, who are the biggest selling newspaper in the country, um, were up against them. So getting, getting fair coverage was, was almost impossible. Uh, no social media. And so getting our message out was probably the most difficult thing. And so when the idea came up to let's have a rally, will people get behind it? And, and so we were quite nervous because had that have backfired, it would have shown News Limited, it would have shown the courts even, you know what, these guys, they don't even have the support of their, of their, of their own people. Uh, when they turned up in the numbers that they did, and I still remember turning up there and marshalling in Chalmers Street, and I looked over and there was Mick Cronin, and there was Billy Moore, and there was um, Steve Roach, there was Benny Elias, guys that, you know, were, were, were legends of the game had no affiliation with the Rabbitohs at all, but there they were, there supporting, supporting what we are doing, you know, and that gave every, all the other supporters that were around as well, wow, you know, it was a real change in sort of attitude. Yeah, the, what we're doing here is, is, is meaningful, and you know, it's, it's touching these greats of the game, and then we're on the right track. The history, one of the greatest days this time I've ever seen, and a long history we've got. Who will be asking you in 10, 20, 30 years time, where were you on October? We started to realise that uh, there was a, a groundswell out there, there was momentum out there in supporting Souths and really opposing the sort of uh, uh, bullies in, the, in rugby league who'd kick this, um, this sort of favourite dog uh, when they were down, as Souths were down. So I think in that sense it was, the march was important because it, it showed that there was a groundswell. And then it just built and built and built and then it became this, you know, it became this movement almost where, hey, this is, this is more, more than rugby league, it's more than you know, a, a team getting thrown out of the comp, this is about, about getting bullied by you know, a, a commercial giant, you know, and, and nobody likes that, everyone backs the underdog, and you know, I tell you what, there's no, there was no greater underdog story than the Rabbitohs taking on the might of News Limited. George uh, at the time called for people to boycott News Limited, uh, Media, Foxtel, etc. The papers, and that, newspapers. The papers, uh, the Telegraph. And that hurt them. That hurt them a lot. And later when we had discussions with people at News Limited, they actually told us that their circulation of the Daily Telegraph had dropped by nearly 200,000 because of their stance. I think it was something like 600,000 a day. It dropped to about 400,000. So we, we hurt them. Yeah, it, it certainly was gloves off. Um, but they had a problem in that a number of us uh, had regular access to the media. We were the media and we didn't let it drop. So, of course, they're a very powerful media organisation and they were able to use that, but they couldn't silence the other voices. The NRL has uh, uh, took us out of the competition for the year 2000. <laughs>
I'm pretty sure I was at the club with the rest of the people at the seniors, South Seniors. And mate, the outpouring of emotion, because there was a lot of people at the seniors club at Redfern waiting for that statement to come. And it was handed down. In true South Sydney form, there were a lot of very loud profanities. <laughs> and the NRL and News Limited were called a lot of really nasty things instantly. And everybody was shocked, shattered, and stunned that that could happen to a club like the Rabbitohs. Everybody was devastated. We were devastated to hear that and to, to all be at the club and the club be packed and for them to say the Souths weren't going to be part of the Premiership. They weren't inviting them. We really didn't think they'd do it, even though they were threatening. We didn't really think they'd do it. What the lawyers of the club were doing before I was appointed in early October 1999, the lawyers were being really fatalistic, the current lawyers, to the point where I went to my first board meeting while they were still appointed. It was that period where there were two sets of lawyers because they hadn't actually terminated me. And they, I walked into my first board meeting and they said, well, he said, got up and said, well, you don't have the money, you don't have the money to pay me. You don't have the money to fund this litigation for the next two years. I think you just put it into liquidation. And it was just dead pat silence. It's my first meeting. And I thought, oh great, I've just walked into this disaster. This is the club I venerate. And it's nothing, it's just a shell. This is it. This is the end of the club. It was unbelievable for me. And this is, this is before the decision to exclude us, a week or so, or whatever it was before. I think it was two nights after that time when I gave my speech. We had the panel of lawyers who each gave their own pitch. And I remember Andrew Denton going like this. The then South lawyers basically plonked a single cardboard box on the table and said, this is all we got, we don't have a case. Which is a pretty low moment. And George goes, well, if you're right, we, to the other lawyer, he said, if you're right, we should put the jersey in the frame now, tonight. Is that what the board wants to do? No, 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 no that made that lawyer totally irrelevant. He had to step down. And they all turned to me and said, run with it. Jump forward two years later and I went into his office in Bly Street in the city and there was a, a room, just a closed off room. I think they started with one box and no case. All four walls were filled with boxes to the ceiling, which was the case. Look, honest to God, I've got to be quite serious. I hope the bastard's rotten hell. You know, George sort of, right! They want to kick us out of the comp, you know? And he's, he's unbelievable at not taking a step back, George, like the dog with a bone and will not let go. And again, I've got to say, you just got to admire him and Nolene for that. Um, but then the right people were on that board and the right people in the background, like Alan Jones, mate. Alan Jones was ringing politicians. Nick Griner was talking to his political allies and, and other people in the other parties going, you know, these people were, were digging in the background and they're heavy hitters. So we had this group behind us that were really sympathetic to South, were diehard Rabbitohs people. George, um, being George Pickens, simply just said, bring it on. You could see with George as in a football field that um, if, if someone hit him with a left and a right, um, George would say, is that all you've got, bring it on. It was the little man, the working class man who'd always been trodden on, who was fighting the big corporate and we need your help people. I was interviewed for Today Tonight and you're not meant to turn to the camera like that but I think I did and I said something like, you know, if they'll come for something like this from people like this, what else will they come for? They're going to come for something that you think is valuable next. And I saw Jan Avent do an interview with Rupert Murdoch at this time in which Rupert talked about the umpires in rugby league, not the referees, but the umpires. And I thought, hang on, here's a bloke who was born in Adelaide and lives in Melbourne and knows Aussie rules. He doesn't know rugby league. He would have no idea that, um, that South Sydney and the pride of rugby league, that you can't have rugby league without South Sydney. It was the worst of times and the best of times. It was, it was painful knowing 
that there was going to be a rugby league competition at senior level and the Rabbitohs weren't going to be there. But the fight, the actual fight for reinstatement and, and this bonding of all this community, um, and I'm talking people of all races and creeds and, and all backgrounds, and they just gel like this and, and you know, this determination and, and this, this will to make sure this, this great sporting institution wasn't going to die. We were all plunging into darkness. We had no idea where this was going to take us. Don't just book tickets to the opening and closing ceremonies. The whole games are going to be good. It's going to be a good court case. You ask Magpies fans, you ask Steelers fans, you ask Bears fans, you don't merge, you get taken over. The South Sydney Sharks? Come on. There was talk behind the scenes that, oh, the Rabbitohs and, and the Sharks should get together. I've always said the door is open for uh, talks if they were interested. You may as well forget it, you don't have a case or merge. There were two people on the board who wanted us to go that way. They put millions of dollars on the table. In most situations, everybody has their price. I will not be a part of a merger. Like, I, I, I don't care what they offer. There was talk in the media that some high-profile South figures were all behind it. There was a lot of this underhanded stuff and, and stories circulating that weren't true. And I even got picked up in a ministerial car from the juniors and taken to the minister's home. George and I ended up not being friends particularly, but I'll give him real credit. He was, he was the personification of the bloody mindedness that, that we all felt. You know, I was in the court and it, it was fantastic to walk outside and the whole street full of people and clapping George. We had a legal team of about four or five people and News Limited had 30 teams. Tucker was you know, like a Mexican bean jumping all over the place in the court and sit down Tucker, it's okay, sit down, wait. I was every day. You know, so help Nick take his books in and you know, push the trolley or not that I knew much was going on because like, I left school when I was 14. And, um, Taylor taps me on the shoulder within about five minutes of, it, of its commencing. I said, what is it? He goes, are we winning?